Thank you. That's that's one of the most powerful songs I know. Because it, it talks about my weakness and the strength of God. In early September, I think it must be the last day of, of uh, August, we were about to, I was about to travel to, Tung, to Congo on an assignment. And then we, I prayed over a land there, a place there, with the bricklayers and said, let this house rise. And within two months, God enabled us to build that house there. <laughs> September and October. Today the house is ready. I, I don't want to just clap. I want you to just wave your hands to the maker of life. And give him glory. God has been so good to us. He's a faithful God. I'd like you to just honor his holy name. Give him glory. We give you glory, Lord, as we honor you. We give you glory, Lord, as we honor you. You are wonderful. You are worthy, Lord. So 
standing your way. You are awesome, Baba. You are awesome. So you are standing your way. You are awesome, Baba. You are awesome. You are standing your way. You are awesome, Baba. There is no one like you, there is no one like you, there is no one like you. Hey, I never know any more. And you will know me, and I'm a new man. Hey, my mother, and you know me, and I'm a new to you, oh Lord. And I sing glory to you, my God. Glory to you, my God, my God, you're mighty and greatly to me pray. Oh Lord, you are good, my God, you're mighty and greatly to me pray. There is no limit to your strength. There is no limit to your glory, Lord. We worship you. We honor you. 
We adore your name. 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 Masare ne bushare ne. Boshana ye mongwe to sumera bo. Etso na mongwe bolo shandere ne. Ele keke keke ele kede mantore mo. Ajo menkla non prata ye sondele mere mo. Ajo lembra kata santo lembere ne. Jamen flara non prete tumba le more. Ajo flara nto se pra kohina ye. Eshante ba lembro ta he la masaye. The angel told me that God wants to resolve back problems. The angel told me that God wants to resolve back problems. You have a challenge in your back, please come and stand in front of the altar. You have a problem in your back. The Lord wants to resolve that now. Just stand in front of the people of God in the altar. Now. Thank you, ancient of days. Thank you, giver of life. The only one who is mighty. Lapo Shata Yavasai Talia. Afojujuma Shonrere. Thank you, ancient of days. Le pata sopuri eta shataya, makata la sataya di hesekete ya. Shekata leva satrahe de shekali va sakata. De kose kali ma shata heli ma sopredi. Mikoto vroni sapataya. Iko lima safrahe tu shetravile. Thank you, ancient of days. Thank you for all the great things you have done tonight. The backs you have healed. Afflictions you have destroyed. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We are, we are not tired of your presence. We need you to go on doing what you want to do. Complete the process in our lives. And let your name be glorified. Thank you, ancient of days. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Please sit down in the presence of God. Yesterday I began to share on the empowering grace. And I gave part one of this message. And in that message, I try to introduce the subject of grace for exceeding greatness. Using the story of Solomon. Tonight, I want to show you a possibility. When you receive grace from God, you become a partner with God. Or better still, you become his workmanship, his instrument of greatness. You become his battle axe. And I need you to understand that as a partner with God, you have become very important. 
and you are responsible for what you get. You are responsible for what you get with the grace of God. When God gives grace to an individual, you have become so powerful, so important, and you decide what you get with the grace of God. Unfortunately, we don't understand that. We assume that the moment we receive grace, God is bound to do things. No, he's not going to do everything. You are responsible for what you get. If the grace is going to be activated or actualized, if the purpose will be fulfilled, it is in your hands. And if there's going to be an abortion, it is in your hands. Therefore, tonight, I've titled this one, Empowering Grace Part 2, bracket, abortion. Empowering Grace Number 2, bracket, abortion. You could easily say, aborting the empowering grace. If you don't want to make it part two of anything, you can call it aborting the empowering grace, the grace of God. And I'd like to read to you from First Samuel chapter 10, from verse 1 to 10. First Samuel chapter 10. I'm reading starting from verse 1. It says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head. And kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has sees caring about the donkeys and is warning about you, saying what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from forward from there and come to the terrible tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God at Bethel. We meet you. One carrying three young goats. Another carrying three loaves of bread. And another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute. And a harp before them, and they will prof- prophesy. I mean, they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings. And make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned his back to go from somewhere that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Verse 10, where I will stop. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Now, I'm sure as a minister, you must know Saul's story. So I don't need to tell you the story. That was the moment of his anointing. Before he was anointed, before that anointing experience, he was spending several days searching for donkeys. And that is very significant. Because that shows you the financial strength of his family. Donkeys are probably one of the cheapest domestic animals. 
In places where donkeys are kept, you hardly search for them. Nobody search for donkeys. They search for cows. They search for goats, sheep. Those ones are valuable. Donkeys are so cheap. I remember being in the north. Well, I go to the north every year. And I was discussing with somebody there. I, I think I want to buy some donkeys when I'm going home. How much am I likely to need? And they laugh. They all laugh. They said, why will you buy donkey? If you need donkey, we will give you up to ten. <laughs> Everybody will donate one one for you. You just carry them. What, but what will you do with donkeys? We know about cow. If you need cow, eh, eh, we talk about price. And so when I read this without understanding, I wonder, why would this whole man, this great man, this head of a family, be traveling all over the place searching for donkeys, one of the cheapest animals, the fact that those donkeys were so important to that family that his father, Kish, could send his glory to go all over the land searching for them shows the strength of that family. It shows us that they are not actually very strong financially. But as soon as Saul was anointed and presented publicly, his status changed. Now that will remind you what I said yesterday. Solomon was insignificant. He was a nobody. He was a weakling. He was the weakest of his siblings. And God chose him. Saul also was a donkey searcher. Searching for donkeys all over the place. Now that shows how important he was in his family and his land. A nobody... Didn't you even hear what he said about himself when Samuel began to prophesy? He said, who am I? I'm the least in the family in, in, in the land of Benjamin. And Benjamin itself is the least in Israel. Why will it be me you are choosing? Now, that would show you something about what grace does. You may be so insignificant. You may be so small. The moment grace comes into your life, that changes. Because grace has capacity to transform your life. Grace will turn you into another man. It will make you great. It will make you to stand out in the midst of the crowd. It will make things easy for you. Because grace is the strength of God that is made available for man. What I'm saying tonight is that Saul became so great as soon as he was anointed. In chapter 11 we saw how he led Israel to find against Nahash the king of the Ammonites who was harassing the people of Jabesh Gilead and Saul destroyed him completely because God enabled him. He destroyed that nation such that the Bible said you can't find two Ammonites standing together again. He, he scattered them. Those who, who were still alive could not stay together. You know, you know the reason why you can't find two together? They are so afraid to even be found talking so that they will not mistakenly recognize that I'm an, I'm an Ammonites. If you see one, you go and dodge somewhere. You won't find two Ammonites together because Saul degraded them completely. How did he get to that? Grace. When grace came into the life of Saul, he made him extraordinary. But that's not my interest tonight. That glory that was put in his life. He was dismantled and destroyed. Although he stayed on the throne for a number of years. But his grace was aborted. 
that grace was aborted. Tell somebody beside you, grace can be aborted. The grace upon Saul was aborted. And the rest of the years he stayed on the throne. He needed another man to fight his battles. It was David that was giving victory to Israel. Saul could not fight any battle any longer. The only battle he fought without David was the one he died in. Upon Mount Gilboa, the Bible said, Saul perished there. And all his men, all those who followed him also perished there. Because his grace had been aborted. He was wasted. You are going to pray for yourself quickly. That your life and ministry will not be wasted like Saul. Can you lift up your right hand and pray for yourself? My life, my ministry will not be wasted. In the name of Jesus. My case will not be like Saul. In the name of Jesus. My ministry will not be wasted. My life will not be wasted. In the name of Jesus. Pray, pray, pray. My life will not be wasted. My ministry will not be wasted. My grace will not be wasted. My grace will not be wasted. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name we pray. Now this subject is an uncommon subject. We don't normally talk about it. But it is the truth. Every day grace gets wasted. It gets destroyed. It gets aborted. Plenty of people who have received grace never fulfill the destiny. And I'm praying for you, your case will not be like that. I say your case will not be like that. You will fulfill your grace. You will fulfill your purpose. You will fulfill your destiny. In the name of Jesus. There's a scripture that most people often misunderstand. And they wrongly interpret. It is Romans chapter 11 verse 29. Romans chapter 11 verse 29. Most people often find it difficult. I mean, they, they interpret it wrongly. It says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. They are irrevocable. The gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Because God does not change his decisions and actions. Which means the moment God has chosen you, you are chosen. The moment God has anointed you, you are anointed. The moment God has given you grace, you carry it forever. Now let me explain that a little bit. It is true. The word of God is true. The pronouncement of a king does not change. The pronouncement of a judge in his status as the judge of a high court is a law. Is a law on his own. When he says it, it cannot be withdrawn. But the recipient of that instruction has a right to reject a judgment. And you can appeal against it in another court. Maybe you don't understand what I'm talking about. When a judgment is made and a pronouncement is made, you can go and appeal that pronouncement. You can, you can upturn it. Even though the law, the one that has been said remains valid. You can bring up another word to counter that one. What am I trying to say? When God positions and anoints an individual, it is final with God. But for the individual, it is not final. For instance, Eli came from the family of Eliaza, the son of Aaron. And by the valid instructions of God, his kids will have continued as high priests in Israel. But they connive with the devil to truncate that plan of God for their lineage. And another family replaced them. 
And when God sent a prophet to Eli to announce it, in in First Samuel chapter two, look at what was said in verse thirty. First Samuel. Let's look at it. I think I have a little time to do that. First Samuel chapter two. Look at verse thirty. He says, therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father will work before me forever. But now, there is a new, a new verdict. The Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Yes, I said it before. But there is something you have done that have changed that instruction. And now I'm saying something different. Which did not counter the first one, but took you out of the first one. Hello. Maybe you don't understand grammar that much. Let me explain it a little more. Sometimes a, a court judgment has been made. A word has been spoken. And that word remains valid. But an individual will be taken out of that word. Say, this thing will not work for this person. For this and that reason. In the case of Eli and his children, God said, even though I have said that it is the sons of Aaron that will continue on the throne. And when Eliezer, your father, your father was there, I said his own children will always be the priest. But now it's too late. I'm rejecting Eliezer because of you. And from Itama, who is also a child of Aaron, Zadok came and replaced uh, Eli without breaking the law of God. Let me come back to, to Saul's story. Saul's grace and his throne was also aborted and it was destroyed upon Mount Gilboa because of some actions he took wrongly that dismantled God's plan for him. He dismantled God's purpose over his life. And I want us to learn from Saul. Why am I focusing on this subject? Because I know that there is somebody here You are leaving this meeting with a special grace. There is somebody here. You are going to leave this convention with a special grace. I said there is somebody here. You are going to leave this convention with a special grace. I'm excited about that. But I'm afraid. I don't want you to be like Saul. When Samuel was anointing Saul, there was a lot of excitement there. Look at all the instructions he gave him. He said, when you go from me, you meet these people, you meet that one. These ones will give you gifts. I mean, that's the first time in the life of uh, Saul that he's going on his way and people will be giving him things. They will give him gifts. They will, you know, and he too will prophesy. Grace was coming upon his life. That was supposed to be the beginning of glory. But unfortunately for Saul, he did not last. Because it was aborted. It was aborted. That glory was aborted. That destiny was destroyed. And I'm afraid for you. I don't want you to leave this place with the grace and lose it by the corner. I need you to understand that the moment grace come upon you, your enemies will multiply. The attacks from the devil you are going to have, will, it will multiply. I had an experience the other time. You know, the Lord visited me and gave me some graces. And he said, this will happen, that will happen. And it began to happen. It began to happen. And then the next moment, I saw in a revelation, the devil came to visit me. And he came, he got to my room, he looked at me. He said, I 
I didn't plan to come to you, but I saw some oil around you that is making everybody to rababa. That's why I came to see you. And I was wondering, what's going on here? He said, anyhow, I'll give you money. Give me that oil. I said, no. You cannot have what I have. I don't need your money. You know what you will say now. That's what I said. And the devil smiled and left. I thought I was free. And then all kinds of battle began. All kinds of battle began in my life. All kinds of attacks began to manifest. And I even I will sleep and see revelation. I will wake up. I won't remember anything. Everything is gone. I, I had a revelation. I saw that God said something. What was it he said? I couldn't remember. Ah, so I began to ask God, what's wrong? And then God said, you didn't know that when you receive greater anointing, greater attack will come. You need to step up your prayers. Ah, I said, I'm praying. <laughs> the Lord said, you have not started praying. That prayer was good enough before you didn't receive power. When that power came upon you, you need more. The first thing you used to do before, you need to increase. And I began, I struggled, struggled, struggled. The first day I succeeded in increasing my prayer level, the yoke was broken. As soon as I slowed down again, the devil took over again. So I know what I'm talking about. More grace. More demonic attacks. More confrontations from the kingdom of darkness. So I'm afraid for you. After you receive grace, will you be able to handle it? Or will you abort that vision? Let's learn from Saul. I want, to, I want you to see a few things that Saul did wrong. So that you will not do them. Number one, he became impatient with Samuel and with God. He became impatient. Now in chapter 10 when he was anointed, if you look at from verse 8 downwards, he was told that he will wait in Gilgal for seven days until Samuel will come to sacrifice for him and give him some instructions. Now you see, sometimes there are some things we don't pay attention to in scriptures. The subject of timing. Timing. Why does he have to wait seven days? Huh? When Pastor uh, Karyo Ojo was ministering in the afternoon, he made reference to this subject. When Moses went to the mountain to receive the commandments, he waited for seven days. It was God that said, Come up. Come. As if God was ready for him. But then when he got to heaven, to that mountain, it was like God was doing a conference and too busy for him. So for seven days he was waiting for God to be ready. There is the dimension of waiting that must come in the journey. But when you are too impatient, you might jump the gun. In the case of Saul, they told him, you will wait for me for seven days in Gilgal. And I will come to you to make sacrifice and establish your throne. Now, he, he, he jumped the gun. Before they established his throne, he raised an army. He raised an army. You know, <laughs> Saul went and raised an army. When his throne was not yet established. Not only that he raised an army. He went and attacked the garrison of the Philistines. When his throne was not yet established. They said wait for seven days. Until I come to establish your throne. He attacked the Philistines. 
before he started waiting. So while he was waiting, the Philistines began to attack Israel. And he was not ready to fight. His army that he raised too early became impatient. So they began to trouble him. What is this waiting we are doing? What is wrong now? Must we sit down here? And he kept on saying, we want to make sacrifice. What sacrifice are you making? Before you were born, they have been making sacrifice. They didn't know. Because they are not the ones who were given that instruction. They can't understand the implication of that waiting. And because of that, he went and did what he shouldn't have done. Many young ministers often fall into this error. And they truncate the process of their greatness before it started. Because there's a time for everything. The first action, after being chosen and anointed, is not to step into battle or start a program. You have received a grace. Ah! And then you go and jump into something that God did not send you. There's a season for waiting. For some people it may be a short time. For some, it may be a very long time of waiting. The, the, the way to know is how long do you, I mean, when the Holy Spirit begins to explain to you. It's not your excitement that should push you. You should allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to start. Most often, when you receive the anointing, He will lead you to the forest. Because there are some wilderness experiences that you must have to be able to last on the throne. There were some experiences David learned in the wilderness that nobody could teach him. When you refuse to go through them, you truncate your destiny by yourself. So you pray one more prayer. I will not truncate my destiny. I will not destroy my destiny by myself. Can you pray that prayer? Rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. I will not destroy my destiny. I will not destroy my destiny by myself. I will not truncate purpose in the name of Jesus. Because he was in a hurry. He started what he couldn't handle. I will not truncate my destiny in the name of Jesus. The time he was supposed to be waiting, he went to attack the Philistines. He attacked the garrison of the Philistines. And those ones came in their might. And he could not wait any longer. Oh, till Lord, that was Allah left. There are some things you went and put your hand into. When you are not ready to have started. You weren't meant to have started. You jumped the gun. I will not truncate my destiny. I will not destroy my destiny by myself. In Jesus' name we pray. Impatience is a terrible thing. It can push you to do what... Sit down, thank you. It can push you to do what you shouldn't do. Because you are in a hurry to go. When you want to run a race, there are rules to follow. Onto your marks... There's a period of interregnum before go, go. That period is so crucial. There is no real athlete that miss that, that, that miss that timing. It is the impatient, frivolous ones that will jump before the gun goes. Onto your marks. And then he starts running. Before the gun goes. And he gets there before everybody. Has he won? Number two. Saul broke God's rule. And offered a terrible sacrifice. On the first day of his real glory. And truncated the glory. He went and offered a sacrifice 
that he should not have done. Now, people who do that, they are meant to die on the spot. Saul should have died at the same moment he offered the sacrifice. But because of the anointing of God that is upon him, the seraph that was supposed to strike him dead could not. But the cherub that was meant to enable his grace, we call them grace enabler, he left him instantly. Because they don't work with rebels. And unfortunately, we have so many people like that today. God may have called you while you were serving under a minister. God may have uh -uh, that there's somebody you have this challenge in your left knee and that region. I think it's an arthritis, a serious arthritis in the left knee that makes it difficult for you to walk. The Lord wants to resolve it. Please, if you are the one, come and meet me in front now. Left, left knee. Left knee. If you are the person, please come. The Lord stopped me because of you. So we will all stop, sir. If you are the one, come. Malika Shataya Mampro Soperia Talaya. Ancient of days. Heal that knee now. Arthritis, get out from the leg. In the name of Jesus, you are healed. Malata Sata Helibo Shetro Kadia. Ancient of days, heal that knee now. You spirit of infirmity, arthritis, out in the name of Jesus. I command total healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Almighty Father. Only you can do what no man can do. Take all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, the cherub that was supposed to enable his ministry left instantly from him. Because they don't work with rebels. Angels don't want, they don't work with rebels. The moment you have broken the law of God, you have incapacitated the angels that are working for you. And we have so many people like that around. You are under a leader. And God grace you up. God is pouring grace upon you. And he still asks you to stay there. But because the leader is careless about one area of his life, you begin an assignment in rebellion. Rebellion won't help you. As a matter of fact, you won't go far. With rebellion, no. You must not start with rebellion. You will create problem for yourself. Saul broke the rule of God and truncated divine purpose over his life. That was the second error of Saul. The third one, he sided with the people against God. Because the people were departing from him, he broke God's instruction. You know that he broke the law was a problem on his own. But the reason why he broke the law was another problem. Now, if he had offered that sacrifice, you know, without, I mean, it would have meant another thing. But the reason why he made that sacrifice was because the people were leaving him. People were going away from him out of fear. So he offered the sacrifice to keep the people that is, he sacrificed God to have people. You don't understand what I'm trying to say. Let me try and pick it in another way. There were people around him that he gathered. And he thought he was going to go with them to war. Then, suddenly he noticed that the people were leaving him. And he found out that the reason why they were leaving was because he was keeping the word of God. God had instructed that he should wait until the priest comes to make the sacrifice. So because he was keeping that law of God, 
people were departing away from him. So he now made up his mind. Who was more important? Is it these people or God? So he chose the people over God. And he offered the sacrifice to please the people. And displease God. Now, to honor people above God is a terrible issue in the spiritual realm. Because God has said it repeatedly, openly, that He's a jealous God. He said it, oh, He didn't hide it, oh, that He's a jealous God. Uh, is there anybody who doesn't know that God is jealous here? We know that He's a jealous God. So the moment you place anybody above God, you lose your grace. You lose your favor in his sight. You lose him. When that happens, it's implied that you have abandoned the one who called you. It's implied that you have abandoned the one who anointed you. The one who positioned you. It means that you prefer people to God. Now let me tell you something. As you begin to manifest, people will begin to see you. And begin to talk about you. Some of them will tell you that you are better than your leader. You are under a spiritual leader. And the man is blessing you. They will tell you you are better than your leader. They, they tell you that. I mean. There, there has never been someone like you before. They operate by flatteries. And that's the reason why they have succeeded in destroying so many people before you. And sometimes they even go beyond flatteries. They use gifts. The kind of gifts that God does not want to give you, they will give you. When God is telling you wait, they will tell you why are you waiting? Come and take. The same thing that you are asking God for, that God is saying wait, they will give it to you. And show you that they love you more than God. That's what worked against that young prophet from Judah. You remember the prophet from Judah? Who was sent to go and speak to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? The Bible said a, a, an old prophet gave him he gave him a donkey, the donkey that God did not give him, the blessing that God did not give him. God said, "Don't eat." He gave him food because he loved him more than God. It was that same donkey that took him to the lion that killed him. When you begin to do ministry to impress human beings, you are on the same pedestal. And you are going to kill yourself before your time. Maybe I should put it this way. Singer, why are you singing that song? Preacher, why are you preaching that sermon? Oh, because that's what people want to hear. They like it. They will love it. Is it because of them you do ministry? As long as another person is the reason why you do what you do, other than God, your ministry will be truncated also. Because you are in the same problem with Saul. What I'm telling you is this. Don't place men above God. Number four. He shifted attention from God to himself. And this is also very important. You were not positioned for your glory. You were not positioned to make you more comfortable. Oh, so that you can shine. Like people will say, I want to blow. It's not to make you to blow. You are being positioned for the fulfillment of a divine agenda. To promote the kingdom of God. When Saul was told his error, he was not even interested in settling with God. Rather, he demanded the honor with men. He said, Honor me before these people. Forget about this, your God, that you are saying is angry with me. Let's, let's settle this matter like this. Honor me first. When you honor me before people, then we'll be talking about God later. 
he shifted attention from God to himself. When he returned from the battle with the, the Amalekites, the Bible said he went to build to Camel to build a monument for himself. He went there and built a monument for himself. Imagine somebody coming from in Israel. You know they normally fight battles a lot. When they finish a battle, the first thing is to go make a sacrifice unto God. In a case, some of the people, the leaders, they, they went and counted those who went to war. And they discovered that nobody was missing. And they brought a special offering to God. They said, we discovered that nobody was missing among us. That's the way Israel fight battle. This man went to battle and came back. The first thing he did was to go and build a monument for himself. A monument for himself. So I'm telling you, beware of that ambition that is pushing you around. That commitment to self that makes you focus upon personal benefits. He wants a fleet of cars. He say, Ah, let grace come. Ah, let grace come. Magba. We finished Eagles Convention in one city. I think it was Manchester or somewhere. And they asked one minister to come and uh, close the meeting. The man took the microphone. Ah! He said, ah! ah. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Ah! He said, we are God to give me one over ten of the grace that this man have. Ah! Egbani Louis. I think he forgot that he was leading people. I th- <laughs> he was just talking, just jiving. He said, Ah, if I just have one over ten of the grace of this man. Ah! Sha, 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 sha. I won't even dress like this again. Ah! You will see me, you will know that man of God has come. Why do you do what you do? Why are you eager to have what you are looking for? To show, to, to shift attention from God to yourself. Excuse me, sir. You need to watch it. Something is wrong in your life. I remember when God began to show me that something was wrong with me. I went to, I, I was invited to come and speak in a, in a, in a meeting. And my vehicle had a fault. That was 1999 or 98. I can't, I'm not sure. I was invited to speak in a meeting in one church, big church. The first vehicle had a fault, the second one had a vehicle the problem. So I said, Lord, repair my vehicle so that I can go for your meeting. And God did not answer. They try all the mechan- the mechanic working on the BMW were working. The one working on the Mercedes was working. None of them succeeded in repairing the vehicles. The two vehicles, none of them was repaired. It was a four-day meeting. By the first day, none of the vehicles was working. So I told God, well, since you didn't repair my vehicle, we will not go for your meeting so I sat down at home and I was calling the mechanic Alpha. The second day, no vehicle, no go. Third day, no show. The last day of the meeting, I went to the mechanic. Share remoto is she no ni. And they said, Well, we have tried though, the thing is not working. So I said, Well, Lord, since it's not working. If you, know, you know I can't go on a borrowed vehicle to preach. I'm a big man of God. And I didn't go. And then God came and met me. He said, son, I sent you on an errand, you did not go. I said, no, it's not me who did not go. It is you who did not enable me. 
And no show on your part, no show on my part. <laughs> hey. And God began to show me that I had problems. I don't want to tell you all that story. Until after God brought me to a zero point. And he said, you don't need any vehicle to do my work. As a matter of fact, why do you need a secretary? You don't need one. You can do your typing by yourself. I said, but somebody must be sweeping my office. He said, what is wrong with your hand? Can't you sweep your office by yourself? That's why up to today, I still don't have people sweeping my office. I don't even have... I, I clean it myself. I clean the place every time I get there. Because I'm a servant now. I went to preach in Baltimore some years ago. And the care team of the church wanted to know what food to prepare for me. And I told them that I won't need food because I was waiting. And the two ladies looked at each other and began to laugh. Ah. And when they realized that I was shocked, they had to explain. And they said, the last guest minister they had was a pain in the spine. <laughs> they said he insisted that they must put my money in his rice. So they went and looked for moima and put it on the rice and brought it. And then he ate the moima a little bit and said, eh, 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 eh. I don't want this moima. My moima must have seven souls. And they said the following day at his request, they brought noodles for him. And he rejected it again because it was not Indonesian noodle. So when I said I was waiting, they burst into laughter. They said, ah. So there are ministers who fast. <laughs> oh my God. In another city, I think it was Tallahassee, the care team of the church came to my hotel room to pack the food they brought for me earlier on that I did not eat because I was checking out and they were, you know, this church I don't know, I don't know what to say about them, their care was extraordinary if you saw the amount of let me not be made, making your mouth to water if you saw the amount of food they brought for me, even me I regretted that I was fasting I regretted that I didn't carry people with me because uh -uh. There were at least about five dishes of um, you know, separate dish for turkey, separate dish for chicken, separate dish for fish, separate dish for goat meat. So, uh -uh. Big dishes oh, with plenty of meat inside. When I entered that hotel room and I saw all those things, I said, ah, egg bami. And they put a microwave there so I can eat everything. They brought all kinds of wine, not alcoholic wine. No. They brought all kinds of juices, and then they now brought fresh fruits. Ah, ah. I was fasting, doing my own thing, and I would normally minister late in the night. And my kind of fasting is I will finish my administration before I go to eat. By the time I'm ready to eat, it's already about 11 p.m. What will you eat at 11 p.m., for God's sake? If you eat, you won't be able to digest it. So I will just eat something tiny, and I will sleep. For the whole of the three days, it was just three days, so they brought food that can feed me for a whole year. So when they came and they were packing everything, the lady, the leader, was like crying. He said, ah, daddy, you didn't eat our food. 
Are you? Are we? Are, have we offended you? <laughs> I didn't know how to answer, but I had to open up. I said, you know, I, I'm not fighting with you. I was fasting, and she said, Ah, you came from Nigeria to fast in America. And I have to explain that I did not come to fast in America. My fasting schedule is running. The America visit jump into it. And he said, you didn't cancel it. <laughs> he said, they were used to ministers who prayed on them. Who will come and eat up everything like locusts. They ate voraciously. And they would take away as much as can be carried. He said, you are eating nothing. Uh -uh. He said, that's the way, even your books, you are giving it to us for free. He said, when they come here, they increase the price of their book. The moment self becomes your God, you really cannot serve God any longer. You may have the paraphernalia, but you know, and the people around you know you are not serving God. You are serving yourself. Pray one more prayer, dear. Give me victory over my flesh, oh God. So that flesh will not stop me. Can you pray that prayer? Give me victory over my flesh. I must have victory over my flesh. People, you, people pass through your ministry and they are regretting that they met you. Because self has taken over. Deliver me from my flesh. Deliver me from my flesh, oh God. Flesh. Flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sit down. A lady, let me, let me say this before I go to number five. A lady came to see me for deliverance. And I ministered to her. After we finished this sharing, the ministration, she said, sir, what am I to pay? And I said, pay for what? He said, for the prayer. And I said, ah, you don't pay for this one. Because it's not the person who prayed that delivered, it's God. She kept quiet. When we finished and I said bye bye, she came back again and said, I was waiting that maybe before I go, you will tell me how much, where I will drop the. And I said, What? Now I don't understand. I already told you it's free. Service is God that delivers. She said, ah, your kind of ministers are not common. I said, what do you mean? He said, she went to do the, the, the same problem. She went somewhere. He said, the man of God told her that before your deliverance can be total, the car you brought, you must give it to God. She was a retired uh, top officer and she bought a vehicle she was using to live her life they took it from her because she needed that deliverance they took that vehicle, she brought it she came in the vehicle, she went on foot without any deliverance when self or the flesh takes over from you as a minister. God is no longer uh, your Lord. You are you, you're no longer serving God. And you'll be a problem. Number five. Saul died to God and became alive to sin. He was no, no longer seeking the will of God in his words. It became uncommon to read that Saul built an altar for God. Or that he offered a sacrifice to God. What you now read about Saul was that he killed the priest of God. 
What you read about him is that he attempted to kill his son. Or he attempted to kill his assistant, David. It was unusual to read that Saul went to seek the face of God. Rather, you see him seeking for a witch of a, a sorcerer so that he can know tomorrow. The moment it becomes difficult for you to spend time alone with God, and you are getting your messages from others, from, from seminars, from things like that, that's where you are getting your message from. You are in danger. Oh. The moment you are no longer interested in staying in the presence of God, something is wrong. They ask Young Gicho. They say, you always stay in the presence of God. What do you do there? And the man said, that's before he died though. The man said, that's my life. That's where strength is. Sometimes I sleep in the presence of God. Sometimes I pray. Many times I listen to him. I just stay in his presence. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. How can you call yourself a minister? And you don't have time to be in the presence of God. That's the problem with some of our fathers. I, I worked with one of them. He will never spend time with God. If he tells you today he wants to, he wants to pray. Say, nobody should disturb me today. I want to be in the presence of God. Wait for him. Give him, give him 30 minutes. He will soon call you. Send message to go and call somebody. There is one. That's how to be in the presence of God. He'll just be talking and talking. Talking and talking. Doesn't have time for God. But have time for every other thing. Don't be like them. As you receive the grace of God. Don't be like Saul. Learn to spend time in the presence of God. Because that's where your life is. The moment you begin to discover that spending time with God is difficult for you. Cry for help. Because at that point, you need help. The moment you notice that you are finding it easy to attack fellow believers, and your interest to win souls is waning, beware something is wrong somewhere. When it becomes normal for you to sin, Rather than crying and mourning your sin, you are excusing yourself. By that time, you are dead. I plead with you don't abort the grace of God in your life. When you see those signs in your life, when you see it in your ministry, you are already dead, though. There are two options. You could either cover it up and decorate your tomb. You know, when somebody dies, what do they do? They cover him up to decorate the place. They begin to, you know, decorate and paint and paint the place. When you cover your sin, that's what you are doing to yourself. You are covering yourself in the tomb. It is the way of the world. What are you supposed to do? Don't bury your grace and destiny. Cry out to God. Let him deliver you. He is the only one who can help you. So that the vision will not be aborted. A certain man came to my office some years ago. And after a little conversation, he busted into tears. And was wailing like a baby. And he kept on sh shouting. And God called me, oh. And God called me, oh. Yes, God may have called you. The important thing is that it, it's not that he called you or did not call you. The important thing is what did you do with the call? What did you do with the grace that he gave to you? That's why I say you are a partner. You are the one that would decide what will happen. In 2010, in a, a city called Kingston in uh, Canada during our Eagles convention there a man came in with a guitar I can't forget that man's story and he requested to sing he was a white man 
You know, Kingston is largely a white city. And most of the people in the meeting were whites themselves. So the guy came and requested to be, to be allowed to sing. And I said, why not? Allow him. And when he began to sing, you will know that he was anointed. You know, when an anointed person manifests, you don't need to be told that he's anointed. After his ministration, then they gave me the microphone and I was sharing. And I look at the man who sang, that white man. I realized he was crying like a baby. As he was hearing my sharing, he was crying. The rest of that evening, he was crying. So, you know, in the, you, in the, in the developed world, when you finish service, there will always be a time of fellowship when you greet each other. That's where you take snacks and all of that. So that time I went and sat with him. And I asked him, why were you crying? I saw you crying. And he opened up to me. He started crying again. He said he received a call to music ministry about 32 years ago. But sin never allowed him. He started quite well. He started and he did quite well. He became popular, you know. But the devil did not leave him alone. Sin never allowed him. The reality that he had aborted his death, destiny dawned upon him as I was sharing. That's why he began to cry. And it was the same sin of immorality. He said, I just, I just couldn't stop it. And for 32 years, his grace could not take off. Oh yes, he was still anointed. Because the gifts and the callings of God, they are without repentance. As he was singing, you will still know that this man was anointed. But there is no paraphernalia that goes with that grace. He had the grace quite well. He was blessed of God. But there was nothing to show for it. 32 years. And I asked myself, if I was God also, you are battling with immorality for 32 years. Of course, you can't go anywhere. He aborted his destiny by himself. In 2000 or 2009 or something, so... I went to speak in a minister's meeting in Okakoko. I think it was Pastor, Pastor Tunji that put up the meeting. An elderly minister was in that meeting. And as I finished, he requested to have a word with me. And I obliged him. So we started the conversation. And he explained to him that he had, you know, been in ministry for, you know, many years. In fact, when he mentioned his, the title two people used to call him, I realized I had, met, I had known him before. You know, the, the people you know by their work that you never met. He had, he, he had tapes that used to go all over the western region at that time. As early as 1981, 82, 83. He had a great ministry. But you know, most of those ministries centered upon testimonies. The man said, Ah! If I had met you when I started ministry and I've had this message you share today, maybe I would not have been aborted like I was. He said, I am a carcass. A golu. God called him God enabled him but immorality did not allow him to stand unfortunately I couldn't help him it was too late to even help him but I had his story so that I can use it to help me and to call people like him who are going down the drain 
when they can still be helped. The fact that you are listening to me tonight shows that you are not lost yet. You could still cry out to God and He could still help you. You can still ask for His assistance today so that heaven will not mourn over your grace. You are not the first person who will receive grace. Plenty of people have received grace that heaven mourn about. One elderly man of God came for one conference somewhere. It was a minister's conference. He had become blind. And he said he, he wanted to talk. And because people knew him now, he's, if I mention him, a number of you will even know him. He has a name that everybody knew. So they gave him a microphone. He said, Emma, that be a well. Don't be like us. So. He said, I, I, I'm not, they didn't invite me to come and speak. Oh. God sent me to come and warn you. You must not become like us. Oh. And he hit his penis. He said, It was our penis that destroyed us. He said because of the advantage that they had, they thought they could be sleeping with everybody. He said, look at it now, I cannot see again. It's part of the, the sorrow of my abortion. When abortion takes place in the life of a man, all kinds of trouble will come upon him. In the case of Saul, the Bible said, and a spirit huh? An evil spirit came upon him to torment him. To torment him. Because he failed divine purpose. that into a prayer now. Rise up. Everybody rise up. It's not enough to receive grace. It must not be aborted. You are going to pray. My destiny will not be truncated in Jesus name. My destiny will not be truncated in the name of Jesus. Pray. 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 What stop my fathers will not stop me. In Jesus' name we pray. Listen to me a bit. I went to do a meeting in a city. God opened the door in that city. 
And God connected me with one big minister there. And he was the one hosting my meeting. But as soon as I stepped into that church, the Lord told me, you are not going to stay long. Do meeting here for long. You will do it for just three years and hand over to this man. He said, you are meant, God was telling me, you are meant to enable his grace so that he will continue the work. And I intend, and God began to tell me about him. I intend to use him in the whole of that block, that area of the nation. So I was, I knew what I was supposed to do with him. All of a sudden, I heard that he was very ill. Ah, God spoke to me now. I prayed and prayed for him. I prayed and prayed. Prayer did not work until he died. After he died, ah, ah, I was so angry with God. You told me this about this man. God did not say anything. The following year, God said, go and do a meeting there with ministers. I said, I don't feel like going, Lord. But because you said it, I will go. Because I'm too ashamed that these guys could die like this. He was a young man. And I went there and I, and God told me what I should share. I'm supposed to share with them on winning the battle of immorality. And I shared that message. By the time I finished, the wife came and knelt down in front of me and started crying. He said, I wish you came to do this three years, five years ago. Maybe my husband would have been spared because it was adultery that killed him. Ah! I was shocked. Adultery killed him. A young man. Ha! Huh? That glory that God had on mine. That plan that God had for him. All of it truncated. Just because of sleeping with women. Ha! Huh? Ha! Huh? When Reuben was sleeping with Biha, he didn't know that he was destroying his destiny. Check in Israel. There is nobody from Reuben who became something in Israel. In the entire Israel. Go and check. You can't see a king that came from Reuben. You can't see a prophet that came from Reuben. You can't, no great person from Reuben. Even Zebulon had prophets. Nobody. No great person from Reuben. Because one day, Reuben did not have control over his penis. You are going to pray. Ah, Oluwa. My destiny will not be truncated. What killed my fathers will not kill me. Can you pray? Pray for yourself. My grace will not be wasted. My destiny will not be destroyed. In Jesus' name. Ah! Lord my God. Shale mama baba. Hey. In Jesus' name we pray. Excuse me, sir. 
You are not the first person to, to receive grace. So I read about Samson and I became afraid. Samson, he was so anointed that he would single handedly fight a war. He alone because of grace. Ah! Samson. And the Bible says he put his head at the lap of Delilah. Ah! The glory of Israel. The destiny of Israel. The grace of God. He placed it on the laps of Delilah. And that woman kept on, uh, where is your power? Show me where your power is. And the idiot was telling him all kinds of things. Uh, if you do, if you bind my hair, uh, if you do something. And he still stayed here. Can you borrow the number? Can you my jewel? Could I feel less? Let me see whether it will change the color of my hand. Fire. You are going to pray. Give me zero tolerance for sin. Give me. In the case of Samson, he kept on doing it. He kept on doing it. But one night they say he went and slept with an alert. And they came and attacked him. He woke up from sleeping with Harlot and carried away the. And the anointing still worked for him. He didn't know that something was happening in his life. He thought, yes, I can do it and have my way. That's why he could put his head on the lap of Delilah. What, are you, what can you do to me? I want the anointing. There's nothing we cannot do. You are going to pray. Give me zero tolerance for sin in my life. Zero tolerance for sin. I don't want it. That habit that will kill me. That sin that will stop me. Uh -uh. Every relationship that is aiming at destroying my destiny. I must put an end to it. Help me to put an end to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lastly, you are still going to pray. You know, when, when we were, when I was smaller than this, there was a particular minister. I don't want to mention his name. He was known in the whole of the Western region. He was a deliverance minister. When this man comes in like this, and is walking through the congregation like this, you see people falling down. He is not touching them. They are falling. He was the first person that people started falling in Africa, in Nigeria here. If he pass you by and his shadow hits you, you are going to the floor. He was so anointed. There was no demon he cannot cast out. He cast out he, 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 casting demon. All the campuses at that time. Meetings everywhere. Crusade upon crusade. I thought he had died. But I recently I, I saw him and realized he was still alive. The grace has gone. The power has gone. Ah! I said, this man is still alive? Oh, well, you be alive, see? How did it begin? The devil pushed him and pushed him until he began to cast out demons from the breast of women. 
from people's private parts. That's where he said the, the demon is, has moved there now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's gone now. Even though he's still alive. Otiku Sori Oro. You are going to pray the last time. My grace will not die. My vision will not be destroyed. My destiny will not be truncated. Whatever I need to let go, help me to let go of it. My vision must not be destroyed. My grace will not be aborted. It will not be aborted. It will not be aborted. In Jesus' name we pray. Now in closing, there are some people here. You know you lost it. The grace God gave to you before. You lost it. I don't know what you did. Maybe your case was like that of Reuben. Maybe your own was like that of uh, what's the name of that boy with his brother that ate Esau. Maybe your case was like Esau. And you ate your destiny. You ate your grace. But the Lord told me that there are some people here. You lost it completely. And you want to start afresh. You need divine mercy to give you another chance. You know, when my son was leading the, uh, I mean, the one who took uh, uh, music, uh, was talking, he said God wants to bring graces back to people. He's correct. God wants to give graces, but it starts with mercy. You know you lost it and you want it restored. Kneel down in front of the altar of God and ask Him to restore back to you. Ask for mercy. 
you know you lost it. You know you did what you shouldn't have done. And you are asking for mercy. Come before the Lord and ask for mercy. Tell him, tell him, tell him your heart desire. Ask me not to gentle say in your my own cry. Why alone know that thou art more holy? Do not pass me by. Savior, 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 hear my humble cry. Hear my humble cry. Why, Lord, know dost thou art so holy? singing, as we were praying, the Lord said to me, I don't need your grace in heaven. I don't need your grace to do my ministry. It is you who need the grace. So why will I take your grace from you? Which means that God is ready to restore. But he said, the question is, what will you do with the grace if I give it back to you. Are you sure you will not go back? Because if you go back, it will be worse. It will be worse. So the Lord is saying, are you sure? Because mercy is about to be poured now. Are you sure you will not go back into it? Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, ancient of days. The God of mercy. I give you glory. I give you glory. Everyone kneeling before you and asking for mercy. Lord, pour your mercy. Lord, pour your mercy. Lord, pour your mercy. Let their errors be wiped away. Amen. Let a new time begin. Amen. Some of them have completely wasted the time. Redeem time for them, Lord. Amen. Let a new glory begin. Amen. Oh, thank you, ancient of days. Oh, thank you, giver of life. I give you glory. Yes, some of you, you will experience God in your dreams tonight. Because every one of you will experience the goodness of God. God has forgiven you. A new realm has started. 
In fact, one of you, you have been battling with uh, uh, prostrate, pro prostrate problem because of this error. And the Lord said, he has dealt with that prostrate problem. And your healing is permanent in the name of Jesus. I prophesy that as you rise from this place, a new glory come upon you. Your lost grace be restored back to you. That a newness of ability come upon your life. And your destiny will begin to be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus. Ah, thank you Holy Spirit. It is not by power. It is not by might. But by my spirit, said the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ancient of days. Thank you, Lord. Please rise up. It is done. You see, I, I, the Lord has done it. The Lord has done it. And uh, we are going to celebrate.